Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope everything, everyone is feeling healthy and well this morning. Um, funny story, I'm actually not supposed to be moderating this session, but uh, I think everyone has had an experience with Kenyan traffic at this point. Um, so this is uh, our session, uh, a new session of GLF called um, GLF Talks. It's fun, vibrant, effective way of delivering life and world-changing ideas in just seven minutes, and st strictly seven minutes. So we will have like a gentle reminder when you have two minutes left. Um, yeah, we'll have that board for you guys. So the first speaker this morning is Mark Nicholson. Mark is the director for Plants for Life International. Mark is an ecologist who has worked in 17 African countries, and he will deliberate more. Please help me to welcome to the podium, Mark Nicholson. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My question is, can humans create a natural forest, or is it an oxymoron. Um, an oxymoron is a contradiction in terms like deafening silence or living dead. It means the, the uh, and is it therefore possible for humans to create what nature creates? Um, all of you will, it's not going forward, how do I, is it on? Thank you. Uh, this is a natural forest, or I call it a native or indigenous forest in western Kenya. It's called Kakamega Forest. And it looks like a virgin forest, but actually if you go closer, it's not a virgin forest. It's, it is a natural forest, but it has an abundance of invasive species. And um, <clears throat> it's, but what it does have is very old trees and very large canopy trees. In complete contrast, we have a plantation of eucalyptus, um, and as you can see there, very low biodiversity. So um, this picture is interesting because we went up there, I collect rare species of, rare species of plants, and uh, we went up to Western Kenya, and this, was a, this is a forest reserve. We went up six weeks before I took this photograph, and we found a tree uh, uh, th that had fruit on it, and we said, we'll go back in two months. Two months later, we went back. What a, was 100% canopy forest had been totally destroyed, almost totally destroyed, and that, that was left. But what's interesting is the Kenya Forest Service uh, defines a forest as 15% forest cover, and this still is more or less 15%, but it has been totally destroyed. This is the, this is the locality where our forest has begun. As you can see, it's mostly a monoculture of tea with a lot of eucalyptus and other uh, exotic species. For those of you who don't know about tea growing, for every four acres of tea, you have to have one acre of eucalyptus in order to dry the tea. Um, this is the exact site where we've created a forest. We, have, we started absolutely from scratch. This is a, con this is a convention center about 30 kilometers north of Nairobi at 2,000 meters. And this is a film photograph um, which I took in 2000, and you can see 100% uh, or nearly 100% uh, exotic species. But if you look very carefully, if you look at the, if you look at the, uh, if you look at this tree here, that's an indigenous tree. And you look at the next photograph. Um, if you just keep your eyes on that tree, the next one, this is the same forest 15 years later, actually 17 years later. Um, so first of all, why did we do it? The answer is in, in the four or five decades that I've been working in Kenya, all I've seen is destruction of forest and a huge decrease in the amount of wildlife. Um, and secondly, we decided to create a forest in order to show people that actually you can make, you, you can have a source of income from a native forest. For example, timbers from things like meru oaks. We have shade coffee. It's very high altitude, but very high quality coffee. Um, we just started a honey project. We have indigenous vegetables. 
Um, but above all, we, I'm interested in plant conservation, indigenous plant conservation, because I'm absolutely sure that every single species has a value to man. The problem is we don't know what the value is. So even a weed, we don't know what its real value is. So, I, uh, so I've seen so much destruction of, in, of, uh, of native plants that we decided to start a forest. So how did we do it? First of all, we took down, over the, over the first 10 years, we took down 40 hectares of eucalyptus, of cypress, and of wattle. Um, then, of course, we went around collecting seed. We started a, a tree nursery, and then we planted out. Now, if you look at this picture carefully, this was originally eucalyptus. And in this, we, this is probably th two or three-year-old trees and completely well weeded. Look at it two years later. That is the invasive species coming back, the eucalyptus regrowth, prunus pudum, sestrum, or um, Solanum mauritianum. Uh, weeding, we spend 60% of our budget on controlling invasive species. Um, here we are again two years later, but the good thing about this photograph is you'll see indigenous trees already coming up two meters and uh, slowly it is becoming a forest. This, where, where there were cypress plantations, if you cut down a cypress you have no regrowth at all, so we planted uh, we planted grass, and then in 2001 and in 2003, this is a picture of the young forest, and that's what it looks like today. Um, wattle forest, uh, you, for every one indigenous species, we've, you probably have a thousand young wattles coming up. Uh, the only problem is on grassland is that we have dikers, and dikers eat a lot of uh, particular species, so you get a bias in the species which come up. That's uh, an example of a vangueria which has been eaten, but it's growing from the, from the bottom. So we have very high biodiversity, but what we don't have is old trees. But I say to everybody, a forest is more than trees. We had to introduce orchids, we've introduced ferns. Um, some things have obviously come in naturally, lichens and fungi. And we have a lot of other species, which we call trophic levels. This is a chameleon. Greater Gallegos are flagship species. Colobus monkeys came in, they've been away from the area for 80 years and they came back in 2015 because they have the indigenous trees to eat. Uh, we have several species of bats, hornbills, sunbirds, hedgehogs. Um, the higher trophic levels, what we call apex predators in our area, civet cats, jenny cats, and we have lots of different species of insects about which we know absolutely nothing how it fits into the whole system. Um, this is a, a, a pioneer species which is heavily eaten and it took us years to find out what was eating it and we found out it was a little beetle or it was a larval stage of this chrysomelid. So there we go. We do not say that we, are, we have restored a forest, but we are restoring a forest. And how long does it take? We have 30 years for this project. We're in year 18 of a 30-year project, but it might take 100 years to be able to say, I have restored the forest. And my question is, can we say that will an art that this is, is effectively a man-created forest? It's an artificial forest. Will it ever become a natural forest? I don't have the answer to it, but we're trying. Um, thank you. Um, my colleague Sarah has actually just arrived, so um, she will be taking over this session after our next speaker. Our next speaker is Robin Chasden, who is a professor um, at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Connecticut. She will be speaking on enriching landscapes and lives by bringing back forests and trees Please welcome to the podium, Robin Chasden. Thank you.
What if trees and forests could miraculously spring forth from the earth in places where they've been cleared or replaced with other vegetation or even with bare ground? What if these new trees and forests could be managed and used by local people who have access and rights to them, enhancing their food security, livelihoods, and supporting local species of plants and animals? What if birds and mammals could take care of the difficult job of selecting and planting seeds and ensuring genetic diversity and conservation of local varieties and locally important species? And what if local people were the stewards of the process of natural regeneration, enriching young forest patches with trees and shrubs that provide timber, food, medicines, and firewood? Happily, this is not just a dream. It is a reality in some places and can provide a path for restoring landscapes in many places around the world. Natural systems have an innate drive and a potential to restore themselves and to regenerate. It is their main business. Regeneration is what they evolved to do. Here in northwestern Costa Rica, large areas of tropical dry forest have grown back spontaneously over the last 25 years. We can harness this potential and we can provide assistance to nurture trees and enrich regenerating forests. This is a partnership. People nurture nature and nature in turn nurtures us. We move forward together in a feed forward positive cycle. We can enrich and enhance natural systems for our benefit while sustaining them for future generations and creating a living legacy. We don't have to plant trees everywhere to restore forests, woodlands, or landscape functions. So what would a partnership with nature look like as a foundation for landscape restoration? It could look like this. Here we're at the Serra do Mar in the Atlantic forest of Brazil, where a native threatened species, Euterpe edulis, a palm, is heavily exploited for palm heart throughout this region, but produces seeds, the pulp of which is used to extract a juice that tastes and has a texture very much like acai, if any one of you have ever had acai, but it's even more nutritious. And the frozen pulp is sold across a wide local region. We also have, the, the species is grown in uh, managed secondary forests, where uh, together along with bananas, and pehibaye, palm hearts, and other fruits, native fruit species, which are sold commercially, along with manioc root and other products. This, uh, this management also enhances cultural values for several different ethnic groups and promotes diversity of over 200 species that are used by local people. It could also look like this in a much drier region here in the Sahel. Here we have several species which perform very important functions and which are coaxed out of the ground from rootstocks through farmer-managed natural regeneration. Fade herbia, albida, is a nitrogen-fixing legume and stimulates increasing, increases in crop yields in the areas around the trees. Combritum glutinosum produces high-quality firewood and also modulates soil temperature beneath the crowns, creating better conditions for crops. This practice is spreading virally throughout the Sahel and other regions of Africa. And amazingly, the cost of farmer-managed natural regeneration is less than $20 per hectare. Or it could look like this. Here we are in Zambia, in Luansha, in the Copper Belt province, where assisted natural regeneration is being used to restore landscapes. These forests here pictured are five to 10 years old and have been treated uh, in a variety of ways for approximately three years. 
These are typical Miyambo forest tree species. The farmers that have restoration, restoration sites on their farms uh, have beehives for honey production, and generally they harvest edible mushrooms in the rainy season. And in later stages, sustainable wood harvesting is planned. These are all examples of co-production, where most ecologic ecosystem services are actually co-produced by a mixture of natural capital and various forms of social, human, financial, and technological capital. The natural capital can also exist in a hidden form in the landscape, which we call ecological memory. Ecological memory is represented by seeds, remnant trees, hedgerows, living fences, and rootstocks. It can be quantified and mapped, along with other social and biophysical factors, to predict the local potential for natural regeneration, which can be used in planning at the local and regional level. Where there's more ecological memory, indigenous trees and forests can be more easily brought to life. And where there is no ecological memory or very little, restoration requires costly and often risky tree planting. Bringing trees and forests back to life enriches the lives of people in many ways, culturally, socially, and economically. It can also bring some challenging trade-offs, as when native fauna return and can destroy crops. You may have heard of the local food movement. People are interested in eating food that is produced locally rather than from long distances. Let's create a local forest movement and empower the growth of managed and assisted regeneration of trees and forests in our own landscapes. Let's bring to life the latent memories that are lurking around us, often hidden and ignored. They're waiting for us. Let's convert these memories to realities and keep them in our present and pass them on to future generations. They are nothing less than the future of life on Earth. Thank you. Robin, and from what you said, I took something out of it, that if we appreciate our locally made food, then I mean, we will appreciate growing it in our countries. And I think it's really inspiring. Thank you very much. Um, we move on to the third speaker for today. And, and he's in the person of Tun Vogel. I don't know if I pronounced it right. And then one thing that intrigues me here is that he's, a, they, he's working with a colleague and they are developing a bio degradable product that is aimed to stop erosion and restore degraded landscape, which is amazing. Um, help me welcome Tune Vogel. So, uh, good morning, Global Landscapes Forum. Uh, good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm very happy. I'm very glad to be presenting here. Uh, I heard that up to thousands can be watching this online, which really makes me uh, excited and also really makes me realize that nothing should go wrong. Like, for example, this. I'm, I'm very sure that you all recognize it, that all of a sudden your system stops and just wants to shut down. And then what you want to do is you want to you click Control Delete to refresh it, to reboost it. You want to get it back in a stable position. But when you do it, it only becomes worse and worse and worse. And then you realize you have to reboost it, give it a kickstart. Well, that is exactly what we also see in the process of land degradation. We are putting a lot of pressure on, on our earth. And at some, in some areas, this has led to very low vegetation covers, to high erosion rates. You can see that in this, uh, in this figure, we have an ecolo ecological threshold. And at some moment, nature, you can see the line. Nature is going up and down a bit. If it's moving, there it is. Oh, yeah. Okay, there it goes. Yeah, nature is moving up and down a bit, but at some moment, it, cr it passes the ecological threshold. And from that moment on, it goes up, down very quickly. So it stops, and uh, that's the... Uh, it's, it's okay. It's okay if you leave it like this. This is the, the, drop, the, the drop that I want to show you. 
is their erosion rates start to grow and vegetation cover goes down and then you end up in a negative cycle of more erosion and less vegetation cover. And the problem is, if this figure is working, um, well, I'll just keep it like this, is that nature is not really able to get back above this stable position, above the ecological threshold. And that's why I want to stress that I believe that um, uh, sustainable restoration projects focus on, um, on getting nature back above this uh, ecological threshold, on a, yeah, to give it the first kickstart, the first control I'll delete, and then let nature do the rest. Focus on that. In my studies in the uh, in University of Wageningen, uh, and also in my work, I've seen land degradation in the field, and that realize, uh, made me realize to really come up with an affordable and sustainable solution. Well, I um, came across an ID together with uh, a, a colleague of mine, a designer, and together we created the Ecosystem Kickstarter, which is, to my opinion, a, uh, could be an, a, a good solution in the, in the fight against land degradation. This is, uh, well, it's me and, and my colleague. And, um, well, what is it? Um, we have uh, wrote a proposal to the Netherlands Enterprise Agency and we now have funding for a feasibility study. And I'll uh, explain you a bit further what it is. We've seen land degradation in the field. We have seen s very steep slopes and hardly any chance for seeds to germinate because heavy rains wash them away very quickly. So we came up with this idea, which we call the eco e Ecosystem Kickstarter. It is a cardboard honeycomb structure, which is folded, easy to transport. And in the field, you unfold it. You put it there, it can be implemented in the field. You install it, and it's filled with the local soil. So uh, you see it here on, the top, on top of the soil, but it's in the soil, and it's filled with the local soil, and it's um, seeds there also in it, and nutrients and manure. It's all in the cardboard, it's impregnated. Well, it's an affordable solution, it's quite, it's, it's affordable per square meter, and also uh, it tackles different problems at the same time, so erosion, but also water, um, uh, water uh, stress, because if it's implemented in the, in the soil, it serves as some sort of sandbag, so it stops erosion, the water that flows there is being stopped, can infiltrate slowly, and there the ecosystem uh, can start, start growing, because the seeds are there. Another figure is to show that, it's, of course, it's biodegradable, because it's cardboard. So in the second row, you see that it's being implemented in rows. The third row, you see that the, uh, the seeds start to grow, the ecosystem start, you know, well, gets get kick-started, and then in the fourth row, you see that the cardboard starts to degrade. It's biodegradable, leaving organic matter in the soil. And then, hopefully, the roots, the rooting system of the seeds is strong enough to prevent further, uh, future erosion. Okay, so as I said, we <coughs> received money for a feasibility study, which we are doing now, so we're, we're developing the product, but also we're testing it in Uganda in different locations. Um, and in, these, uh, in this feasibility study, because I, I can almost hear you thinking, oh yeah, another big marketing story, another big success story. Well, we don't know, we don't know yet if it's, if it's a success, but we really, really want this product to be demand-driven from the very start. The idea was born in the field, meeting the people, seeing land degradation. We are now trying to get to the communities and ask to them, what do, what do you think? And reshape the whole design with them, because we are now in the start of the project, we want to reshape it. And also, to make it demand-driven, the produ product, we're here. We're here to meet you, uh, to hear your questions, to hear your remarks and suggestions, and also to find potential collaboration for testing and implementing the product in, in the field in the future. So we have already a partner which, uh, who gave us the, the funding, which is the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Uh, and besides, we also uh, have uh, help from the Wageningen University and from iOpenerWorks, which, which is an organization in Uganda. And, well, we're basically looking for everyone, for organizations, for big companies, for governmental agencies, because we need your help and uh, want to rethink the whole idea to make it a big step forward in the fight against land degradation. Because we want to bring Global Landscapes Forum and our ID together. You can find us uh, just because we want you to leave us a message, Facebook, we have Instagram, of course, and also 
uh, a website which is still in development, but you can uh, leave your mail address there so um, we can send you regular updates. But please also send us um, yeah, your IDs and please meet me after this discussion and later today I'm here. I'm really willing to, uh, to hear your IDs. One last uh, uh, remark is really this is not a big marketing so it's a story. I really want to stress that this is a serious request for your help in uh, the challenge, maybe the challenge of this generation, restoring, restoring our beloved Earth. And it's not solely by human intervention, but using human intervention to get nature back on track, to get above this ecological threshold. And it feels a bit strange to be working on a product that's intended to disappear because it's cardboard. But I think that is exactly the reset button, the control delete, the kickstart that nature needs. And now my question to you is, did we hit the right button? Thank you very much. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's, it got stuck. <laughs> it's supposed to turn, yeah. All right, there it is. OK, thank you very much. Please, let's give me a round of applause. Um, let's try our best to do that anytime our speakers are done talking and when they are asked to come here. Thank you so much, Tune, for this new development, and I'm sure to go a long way to um, save our degraded landscape. Okay, so we move on to our fourth speaker for today, and she's a very passionate woman who's interested in natural resource management in urban and rural settings. And interestingly, she has 100 publications. Please help me welcome Mary, Dr. Mary Injenga. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I want to talk about um, biochar as a win-win, win-win innovation uh, for resilient landscapes. And uh, biochar is when you add char into the soils. Uh, win one, enhancing energy efficiency. Uh, growing trees in the farms has multiple benefits. One is that intercropping trees with crops or pasture improves soil conditions. The next thing is that uh, trees on farm provide firewood. Wind two, having trees on farm to source firewood for cooking reduces women's burden and improves health. Uh, women go to the forest, spend one day per week to collect firewood. That is unpaid labor. One day out of five working days implies that women are living on a 20% pay cut doing this unpaid labor. Imagine if your salary today was to be cut by 20%. If we continue using inefficient cooking systems, there is smoke. Smoke kills. Nobody should die cooking. Therefore, we should move to using more efficient systems. Win three. Uh, if we have trees on farm, get firewood from the trees on farm, and then use efficient cooking systems like gasifier stove that produce charcoal or biochar as you cook, then the biochar can be used for crop production. Using biochar for soil amendment has multiple benefits. Biochar, when added to the soils, improves the soil conditions, and for one, it enhances soil nutrient retention, water retention, and other benefits. In the face of climate change, 
Retaining water, retaining nutrients is a climate smart agriculture. Windfall. If people, households are cooking using firewood source from the trees on farm with the fish and stuff that produce char or charcoal and then adding it into the soils, that means we are burning carbon into the soils. We are doing carbon sequestration, saving, uh, mitigating climate change. Having trees on farm is also having carbon sinks. The intersections between having trees on farm for firewood, using it in efficient system, reducing emission, reducing fuel consumption, producing char, using it in the farms, this whole system, the intersections, results into resilient landscapes. In summary, I have three key take-home messages. One is that if biochar production and new systems have to be uh, efficient and work well, biomass production must be sustainable. Take home point two. If you look at the forests and look at the agricultural landscapes, should be considered as a continuum because there is a lot of interconnections. Take home message three. This kind of system where we are talking about agroforestry, trees on farm, using it more efficiently at home for cooking, adding it into the soil, it requires a transdisciplinary process where we have social scientists talking with natural scientists and talking with farmers, industry, and others, not South scientists talking together. A, a sense that promotes co-learning. And if we do this kind of co-learning, considering farmers as part of the research process instead of study subjects, then we will be able to understand their needs and aspirations. In these innovations development, if we are able to understand the needs of the people, then we will be able to witness the change that we all desire to see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mary, for giving us three take-home messages. And I, I'm going to stick to the um, point two which is integrating agriculture and our forests. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to our fifth speaker for today, um, who is in the name, person of Amos Abu. Um, he's doing amazing things, and what is actually catching my eye is that he is currently the team, task team leader of the $900 million Nigerian Erosion and Watershed Management Project that is aimed at reducing vulnerabilities to the land degradation, including soil erosion in targeted watersheds in Nigeria, which is, to me, it's something that we all have to look at, I mean, producing results and working effectively. Help me welcome Imos Abu. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a very sophisticated audience. And, and we deliberately, you will soon understand why I said we, decided to share some experiences from a very difficult setting. What are the elements that make us to believe that this is really not business as usual? Uh, you will discover that in our intervention in landscape, for the most part, the issue is the scarcity of water. What then happens when in a situation, really the driver of land degradation has to do with 
water in excess. What then do you do in a context where you have friable soil, soils that have been poorly developed, and in that same context, you have one of the highest population density clusters in Africa with rapid urbanization, road construction, deforestation, I think second to the highest rates in the world, and a fragmented, if not broken, institutional arrangement with conflicting mandates, overlapping mandates, and yet there are gaps. There are also superstitions. Where you see some of these ravines, as you can see from the sample slides, people believe that these are caused by the gods and goddesses, by mermaids, by spirits. And then it takes a lot of financial resources to be able to resolve this. All of this is overlaid by a changing climate. And the situation, especially in the southeastern part of Nigeria, was such that transcended what the country could do on its own, and they approached the World Bank. Now, if you look at the photos before you, these are taken from three separate locations. The upper one shows the situation before the intervention of the Nigeria Erosion and Watershed Management Project. And immediately at the bottom of it is the situation today. At the middle, again, that is at Amachara in Anambra State, you will see the situation prior to the intervention of NewMap and today. And we will have in the audience a member from the community of Amachara. And she will be speaking to us very soon. And then the third in the series of this column is from Edo State. Uh, where you also have the before and after. The results have been transformational. It has been game changing. The project has been understudied and is being understudied both by university students, by countries, and so forth. And as a result, we started with a $500 million project and, and indeed the client requested for another $1 billion so that we can even scale it up to other parts. How were we able to really do this? This is the experience that I really want to share with you. One of the things that we did was to agree that it has to be an integrated approach. It has to go beyond what one sector can do, and indeed beyond what one individual can do. This is why I use the word we, because for this project we have three TTLs. One from agri, the other from water resources, and yours really from environment and natural resources. That is not all that made this possible. We also insisted on state-of-the-art designs that had bioremediation measures. Now, these designs are thoroughly reviewed, but we also ensure that consistently there is a provision for tree planting, for regressing, and for community ownership and participation. Then we also wanted transparency. Non-state actors, NGOs, CSOs were included in the stakeholders. Now, a lot of the drivers of the ravines that you can see has to do with people trying to eke out a living. So it is not just enough for you to say, don't do this, you have to provide alternative means of livelihood. And this is why, in the design and in the implementation of the project, we have a very robust component that provides alternative means of livelihood to the people. And today, over 5,000 people have benefited from the livelihood options. Then, because this water is actually in excess, we also look for innovative ways of making good use of this water. We also have water harvesting infrastructure upstream. Then, the community themselves. They are actually the reason for the success of this project. 
their vigilance, their ownership, their dedication, their commitment is something that goes beyond the normal call of, of duty. Today, the results of the project has changed the narrative of the situation of soil erosion in Nigeria, which prior to new map tend to have defied all solutions. Uh, I have a couple of take home messages. Number one, community should be at the core. In other words, bottom up. Second, we also need to, in that process, create a sense of urgency and have a team of people working on it. Then the involvement of non-state actors for accountability, transparency is really very, very important. And they're giving people options rather than mere saying, do not do this without providing an alternative, indeed a better alternative. Then this project is also known for having a very robust grievance redress mechanism. The land that has been reclaimed, that, are, that is being regrassed and replanted, obviously people materialize from the air to say, this belongs to me. How then do you resolve such issues? This is why the grievance redress mechanism that is actually anchored on the community's own legal system is in place and it works. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amos, for sharing with us your experiences, and thank you for the projects that you are having on the grounds. Um, now we move on to the final speaker for today, and he's in the person of Leonidas Inziki Yimpa. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, he's really involved in prote the protection of chimpanzees and rare species. Please help me welcome him once again. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Nzigi Malonidas. I come from Burundi. And uh, I'd like just to share uh, with you a, a story, a simple story about coffee, about forests, and a uh, community. Uh, I'm based in southern Burundi. Uh, I'm chief warden of protected areas of southern Burundi. And uh, I have... Uh, uh, I work uh, in different protected areas, but uh, I have put an emphasis on one protected area called the natural forest of Borori. And uh, we have start, uh, started an approach which co uh, consists to, uh, to take account, uh, account uh, of different values of the territory. Uh, uh, near the forest of Borori, we have coffee, which is a value in Burundi. We have also biodiversity because we have a forest, a natural forest, with, with many flag species, such as uh, chimpanzees. So uh, in 1994, we have started uh, to deal with the forest, to integrate local communities. Among local communities, we have indigenous people called the Batwa, uh, in order uh, to integrate them in the management of the forest, but also to improve their livelihoods. So, uh, since many years in Burundi, uh, coffee, coffee was conducted uh, in monoculture. Uh, so, in, 1990, uh, in uh, 2014, we have started to associate coffee with indigenous trees in order uh, to impro improve the quality of the soil, the quality of uh, the coffee, uh, also to increase biodiversity. Uh, it's now possible uh, through this experience to produce coffee in the respect of biodiversity, in the respect of uh, environment. As, as you see uh, uh, behind me, uh, now, uh, coffee is associated with trees. Now, we have local communities we, uh, who are involved in management of forests. We have, uh, as you see, we have uh, a community of Batwa. They had no land. 
When we started to integrate this community uh, in the management of, the, of forests, they have got a land. And as I share uh, this experience with, with you, now this community uh, has built uh, good houses, uh, decent houses uh, through uh, this experience of involvement in the manage management of natural, uh, natural resources. Now, uh, the quality of coffee is increased. The quality of the soil is also uh, increased. Livelihoods has started to change uh, positive, uh, positively uh, through this uh, good practice uh, about shade-grown uh, coffee. Uh, this model uh, will be uh, now uh, started to be replicated in the other areas of, uh, of my, uh, my country. Uh, the main lessons, uh, uh, the main lesson th through this experience, uh, we have, we have uh, uh, demonstrated that when you connect people to their nature, you succeed. If, if not, you can't go far. But when you connect people, you improve their livelihoods. When you connect people to their nature, you improve the biodiversity. You save the bi biodiversity. But if not, you can't go far. And when you can't go far, it means that by the, uh, the degradation of the forest, of the biodiversity, you have poverty, and you have many other uh, problems. It means that this approach, this landscape approach, it's a solution for many problems in Burundi. Thank you. So as we all know, we all come from the part of the continent whereby people used to um, rely solely on the forest for their survival. So now policymakers come on board and we say that we want to protect these forests. And we all know that many of these communities that live around protected areas um, are not educated. So they don't see the reason why the forest needs to be protected. So that's why there's a need for us to provide alternative livelihoods for these communities in order to accept the, our reasons for protecting the forest and improving upon their lives. So that was what this second talk on the second, I mean the second block was all about. And our speakers have solely and indeed dissected into this and I would like us to give them a huge round of applause again for <laughs> accepting to be here. Okay, so now we move on to the second session of this, um, of this talk and uh, my, my colleague Zizi will take up. Thank you very much. Hello again. Um, for those of you who are not here, when I introduce myself, I am Zizi Pohoi. I am from South Africa. So how this session is going to go is that we are going to take um, a few questions. We just ask that when you ask your question, just before you ask your question, you just introduce yourself by name and the organization that you're coming from and who your question is directed to. Um, so do we have any questions? Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is uh, Salisu Dahiru. I work on the Nigeria Erosion and Watershed Management Project, of which uh, Dr. Amos uh, eloquently uh, described. Uh, my, I don't, uh, it's not a question per se, rather it's uh, two comments. Um, the first one is to the um, the th third speaker, I am really excited by your presentation uh, because it fits very well into the narration that uh, Dr. Amos gave us regarding the Nigeria Erosion and Watershed Management Project. Um, due to time constraints allocated for this uh, talk, uh, Dr. Amos did not go into the details of the process. Uh, 
in the design and in the implementation. A critical aspect of this project is the blending of engineering works with bioremediation and community active participation. Some of the gullies go as deep as 100 meters and can stretch up to a kilometer. So you are dealing with a very unstable surfaces that probably in one single rainy season could advance up to 100 meters. So your innovation is something that will really add value to the kind of work we are doing because to stem the tide and the rate at which some of these gullies advance, we will need an innovation that blends very well with uh, natural systems, such as being biodegradable and integrated with seeds that will enable the water to percolate slowly and enable these seeds to establish faster. At the moment, for this aspect of what in the project we call a, um, a grass, gully rapid action and slope stabilization, we use a combination of concrete as well as some flexible materials. Some of them may not be biodegradable, but this innovation will really give us an opportunity to integrate a, an innovative approach into this. So your search for organizations that will partner with you, uh, you already have one, and we definitely will be uh, discussing with you um, right after this session and see how best we can partner together. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Vogel, you already have a business partner. <laughs> uh, can, can I just... Yes, yes, please. A very short remark. Thank you very much. And also, uh, yeah, my, just call me Mr. Vogel. That's maybe easier. Or the third speaker. Uh, that, that's okay. My name is Teun, which is a very, I think, uh, an old-fashioned farmer Dutch, Dutch name, which is becoming more in fashion now, but impossible for other people to pronounce, so no problem. Um, thank you very much. We'll have a talk afterwards. Yeah. You know, actually, in South Africa, we have a language called Afrikaans, and your name um, translates to garden in Afrikaans. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions from the floor? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joseph Hitimana from... Uh, University of Kabianga, which is uh, in Kenya, next to the Mao Forest Complex, is a public university. Um, I'm a, a forester by profession. I am the lecturer there and also the dean of the School of Natural Resources and Environmental Management. My, question, well, my questions are uh, few. One is uh, to the first speaker, Mark. He has talked about uh, problem number one, uh, he, he about uh, invasive species. And um, he mentioned Solanum mauritianum. I did uh, some work in Mount Elgon forest, natural forest, and this invasive species was really destructive in 1998. Uh, and uh, literature said that is a uh, is not a native species. It came all the way from Brazil through South Africa, but combating it has become difficult and it destroys ecosystems. So I, I wish uh, he could share with me or with us if they have come up with some ways of controlling these uh, invasive species uh, in brief. And the second question is to 
the professor of ecology, sorry I did not uh, catch the name, uh, I was uh, very impressed by this um, concept of ecological memories. Um, I want to know how um, we can know the potential of such memories in a degraded uh, ecosystem. Are there methods of, of identifying uh, how much of the memories could be there and uh, how, um, let's say, useful they could be because the memories could be there but not enough to restore? Uh, is there a way of knowing how much the potential uh, we have with this technology? Lastly is um, uh, on, uh, is it Tum, Tum or, uh, okay, the third speaker, sorry, uh, to, to what level, um, what level of degradation uh, can this technology uh, be helpful because we could be having so much degraded land that went excessively, let's say rocky places, can we use this technology? Uh, because we have uh, uh, originally come from Rwanda, um, uh, but Rwanda has got so many hills and very old, with the very old plantation of eucalyptus, degraded uh, and uh, you rarely see soil. Uh, so can this technology hold on such kind of uh, base, uh, base, uh, base land? Thank you. Um. Robin, would you like to go first, or Mark? Okay, I'll go first. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Um, Solanum is a, is a huge problem. It's not our worst invasive species, but it's certainly our second or third one. Um, as you know, the birds, it's a toxic plant. Interestingly, the name is Mauritianum, and I thought it was either Mauritius or Mauritania. I didn't know it came from Brazil, but maybe someone else knows where it comes from. Um, the only way we control it is by pulling it out and cutting it down. In fact, we're at the moment we're making charcoal out of it. It's not good charcoal, but it's charcoal. Um, the reason why it spreads so easily is because the fruit is much liked by birds. So they eat the, fr they eat the fruit and then they drop the seeds all over the place. Um, we don't use any chemical uh, herbicides at all. So everything we do is we have to pull them out by the roots. The only good thing about it is that in the canopy forest, um, it doesn't like shade. It tends to grow on roadsides or riverbanks and that sort of thing. So once you've, once you've got a f complete shade, it tends to shade it out and it's not really a problem. Um, before Robin answers, I will just say something on memories. I mean, there had been no indigenous forest in our, in our land for 80 years. If we had just left it with active, with what you call passive restoration and just that there would have been no indigenous plants coming up at all because we've had no indigenous plants there for 80 years, but I'll let Robin answer that one. Thank you. Okay. In terms of how to measure and assess how much ecological memory is, is in the area, it depends a lot on um, what kind of climate. So in a, in a moist climate, where you have well-developed forests in the region, the best measures are proxies for these memories, which are um, how dense, how, uh, what is the forest cover in the surrounding area? We found that a five kilometer radius is a very good uh, approach. The other is the distance from the site to the nearest remnant of forest. It doesn't have to be a national park. It can be um, a cluster of trees even, um, or even remnant trees that are in the surrounding area. So you don't have to go and measure all the seeds that are in the, the seed bank. Or, and these are proxies that have been shown from other research that these are linked to successful natural regeneration in these kinds of climates. In a dryland area, it would be more the hist history of the site in terms of whether or not the area has been plowed because plowing will destroy the rootstocks. So untilled or unplowed land is much more likely to have these trees below the ground. Uh, and I, I would say really um, we, we do need more research on this, but what we've done, the research we've done so far suggests that we can 
really model this, um, knowing features of the landscape, also knowing the history of the land use, and with a few studies of where regeneration <clears throat> has happened and looking at the factors that are associated with that and then mapping those factors, we can get a good indicator of where it's likely to happen. Thank you very much. Um, do we still have more questions on the floor? Yeah, yeah, there was one question for me indeed. Thank you for your question uh, about what level of degradation are we focusing on. Uh, I think what I was trying to make clear also in the presentation is we're still in a feasibility study, so a lot of things still need to be um, uh, investigated. And what we're doing now is just testing and testing about 20 variables of, uh, to see which of them are the best to, uh, to make this product really useful in the field. But I think it's, it's mostly focusing on, on prevention, ero erosion prevention. Um, and, and of course, uh, I think it's, it's, um, it will, in the end it will be really site specific. So the seeds there and the, the, the nutrients in, in, the, in the cardboard will be uh, depending on, on the location uh, um, characteristics. Uh, which will be uh, found out using soil analysis and so on. Um, I think that's. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Uh, no. Thank you so much. My name is Lily Okeo uh, with Work Her Dream Organization. And I'm interested uh, in the concept, the gentleman, sorry I didn't get your name, uh, the shade grown coffee, because as part of our income generating activities, we do agroforestry um, in Wasingishu and other four counties. So how many years would it take to generate, uh, for, you, for the coffee to reach maturity? to be harvested where you have good quality coffee that you can use for commercial purposes? And um, how do you, do you, um, sorry, how do you, how, um, I don't know how to put it, how do you nurture the soils to actually get good quality soil in time to sustain the shade grown coffee? Thank you. Mr. Leonidas, would you like to respond? <clears throat> uh, thank you for the question. Uh, as I have said, we have uh, started this, uh, this exp experience in two, uh, 2014. And uh, uh, what we do is to associate coffee uh, to uh, indigenous trees. Uh, we use uh, many species, such as, uh, if you are botanists, we use Polycias fulva, we use uh, Albizia, Albizia gomifera, we use also Mesopsis and others. Maybe uh, after we... Sorry, I don't understand. I'm a psychologist, I'm not a botanist. Okay, yeah. okay, sorry. So, uh, we use... Uh, indigenous species uh, uh, and uh, we chose species we, which ha have uh, a, fast, a fast grow, you, you say, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, in French we say croissance rapide, who grows, which grows, uh, grow uh, fastly. So uh, scientists say that you need to take eight years to, uh, in, to improve the quality of the soil. But uh, for some species which grow fastly, such as Mesopsis, such as Polycias fulva, you have results in three years or four years. You improve the quality of the, so uh, 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 the soil. Do you create a shade in a uh, coffee plantation uh, you control erosion, and uh, uh, you have many 
uh, many results. I have said that we have started in, uh, in uh, 2014. Now we have plantations of farmers uh, in which you find uh, big trees uh, and coffee under, under shade. It has been a good experience. It, 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 uh, through this practice, uh, as you know, in my country, many people, they depend on fire. Firewood as the main source of energy. Uh, and we had uh, problems of deforestation, land degradation, uh, loss of biodiversity. Now it's possible to produce timber inside coffee plantation. It's, it's, it, it is possible to have uh, firewood produced inside of uh, coffee plantation. As I have said, it's a practice a good practice which brings many solutions uh, for, uh, for farmers. Uh, it has been a good experience because now it, uh, it's a proof that people can protect the forests. Because you have uh, many plantations of coffee uh, near a natural forest, which is a protected area. Before this experience, the protected area was very threatened. Uh, but now there is a good cohabitation between the forests and the community. I think it has been a good experience, and as I have said, which will be duplicated in other areas of my country. Maybe we will uh, exchange more about this good practice. Thank you for your question. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Leonidas. Um, do we still have any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make a few comments. I was highly impressed with the presentation on the potential of natural regeneration and taking into context the opportunity FMNR has actually brought through to empower farmers both in terms of land restoration and securing their livelihoods. I would really recommend to partners who are here and the academic you know, spheres who are here to really consider this opportunity in the climate change scenarios we are currently experiencing. It's not about serious budgets. It can be done. Let's integrate FMNR in our restoration efforts. It's really going to address the community needs and address the restoration initiatives and thoughts we already have. World Vision is a key champion in this. In case you need capacity building on the same, we are willing to support, and uh, the, there's a lot of information in the internet. Please, let's take up this. Thank you. Um, would anybody like to comment on that? Thank you. I think there also, there's an FMNR hub, I, I don't know if um, that you can use as a resource as well. You are right, there is an FMNR hub. Any more questions? Yes, sir. I wanted to direct a question to Mary about the uh, biochar and the charcoal. I mean, definitely in the uh, African context, getting on top of the whole fuel wood demand and getting sustainable uh, value chains for fuel wood is, is, um, is a massive uh, uh, or is of massive importance to, to enabling its restoration. And I really appreciate the system approach you take. But one of the problems with, I mean, these gasifiers have been around for a few years now. There's lots and lots of NGOs working on promoting them. And uptake still seems very, very low. I don't know if you can see some light at the end of the tunnel as to how we can improve the uptake of these technologies. Uh, I completely uh, appreciate what your concern is about uh, the whole um, scenario of improved stoves. Not only the gasifier, but I'll talk about the gasifier, but the cook stove 
improvement systems has been quite, has been there for many years. So the whole uh, question is, what's not going in the right direction or what is hindering the kind of adoption that people would like to see? And that's why I ended up my talk by saying that uh, we want to improve the whole um, cooking as a cooking system. Looking at the whole idea of sourcing firewood from trees on farm and then using them uh, efficiently. For example, in a gasifier, you produce cooking energy but also produce a byproduct, right? And uh, what we've been finding is that a lot of the gasifiers, a lot of the stoves come in different forms, but some of them uh, fail to meet the needs of the people. And uh, so the, the question is, how can we have research and development having a dimension where there is intersection, such that uh, the most important person is the one who is going to use the technology. Let's say, in your case, the gasifier. How does the gasifier work in uh, comparison to the cooking system that these women are, in, uh, are used to? If it really doesn't function the way they are used to the three stone, then you find that even if the gasifier is given for free, a lot of them may not use it. And this has been a long process. We've had this project now for the sixth year, and actually we are trying to look at it from agroforestry perspective, but now also trying to see even if people produce firewood efficiently, and then they use it in, the, I mean, they produce it sustainably in the farms, but use it in efficiently, then there are losses. And so we have come up as a team to really look at issues of uh, ethno, uh, ethnography, design ethnography. Let the women be the ones to say how they want the stoves to be, for example. You have all the principles, but how would they want it to work if they have to switch? Because all we want is some improvement, some changes that improve efficiencies. But a lot of those uh, stoves or even the gasifiers come in ways that is a challenge for the women to use. And uh, that's why we have been also working with the Kenya Industrial Research Institute, which is producing the gasifier, and to get the feedback from the users. And uh, so women are part of the research and giving feedback. And we have seen versions moving from version one of the gasifier two, and uh, adoption increases. But I completely agree with you. It's, it's, a, it's a journey in process, and people really have to understand the needs of the people. If we really have to uh, reduce pressure from the forest, because if people produce firewood from the farms, which might be lesser, then they must use it more efficiently. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question? Yes, yes. Um. Uh, mine is a follow-up on the biochar. I'm sorry, yeah. it's the person it's behind the you. The person behind you. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Rafael Chavez from Brazilian uh, Sao Paulo State Government in Brazil. And I would uh, ask for our friend from Burundi, uh, very direct question. Uh, how much of the land is covered by the trees in the agroforest system? And how, how much cover do you have of indigenous trees in your system, please? Uh, just we use, uh, we can't ex exceed 200, 200 trees per hectare. I think the answer is direct also. Is clear? Uh, have, yeah. And do you know how much cover do you have with these 200 trees? Ah. In percentage okay. of the soil covered by that. Uh, okay. Uh, 
as you as you as you know we associate trees to coffee yeah to bring a shade but it's not a shade a, a total shade uh, you understand uh, i think uh, uh, mr uh, i think uh, okay uh, you bring a shed, but it's not a total shed. Uh, you can't, you can't exceed to a 50 percent of uh, of all the plantation. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, you you need to be situated between 30 percent and uh, 50 percent, but. Uh, uh, mainly under 50 percent of the shade you cre create in the plantation yeah um robin would you like to say something um i just wanted to mention i forgot i have a couple of policy a policy brief um it's in french and english if anyone's interested i have a few copies so come up to me afterwards it's about uh, the natural regeneration for large-scale restoration. So. Okay, thank you very much, Robin. Um, unfortunately, we have we don't have time for any more questions. Our session has officially come to an end. We'd like to say thank you for all of your very good questions. Thank you very much to our speakers. Very inspiring, very world-changing ideas from each and every one of you. Please help me to thank our great, great speakers with a round of applause. And thank you very much to everybody who joined us live online, on Facebook, on the GLF page. Thank you very much to everyone. Please, let's give them a hand also.